Hello and a warm welcome to Portfolio Watch. I'm Kukule Tumfupi. Today we take a critical look at one of the needs for diversifying across asset classes, geographies and sectors in order to achieve long-term capital growth on your investment portfolio. To help us expand on this is Chris Potreter, who is the CEO of Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Chris Gilmore, Independent Investment Analyst. Chris and Chris, for the price, two for the price of one, mm -hmm. right? So clearly we got our investment yeah. strategy right on this one. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Let's take a look at this theme of diversification. We know that it's rule number one when it comes to investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. But before we look forward, what do the past reflections and trends actually show us, um, Chris P, about the dynamics of a diversification? Mm. It's interesting, uh, Gugu. We looked at uh, recently again at asset class returns, different asset class returns over the last 10 years per annum. What, have, what is each asset class delivered? And what is important when we say asset classes, we are talking about equities locally, equities offshore, mm -hmm. very important. Talking about fixed income, cash, preference, dividends, properties, both local and offshore. And in fact, in none of those 10 years, you know, uh, did any particular asset class dominate consistently in uh, 10 top years. performance? Yes, and uh, and at the same time, it was it's impossible to get a pattern to predict. But what you do see is that the top three asset classes, without exception, across all of those years, are your growth assets: international equities, local equities, or property exposure. Mm -hmm. Whereas the bottom three asset classes consistently across those years are, is cash, fixed income and, uh, and preference share exposure. So I think diversification uh, is necessary, absolutely. But the hidden message here is that if you are looking for growth, there is uh, only one asset class that will deliver that consistently over time and that will be equities. But again, one has to be very careful about when you talk about equities not to uh, you know, you have to differentiate between local and offshore. I'm glad that you touch on that because so often when we take a look at the local mm. stock exchange, we mm. know that we've got quite a few companies that have multinational exposure, mm. right, and benefit mm. Uh, mm. from uh, currency crosses and a rand hedges, essentially. Uh, Chris, how does this um, um, play a strategy and role in the uh, critical identification and understanding of offshore equity exposure versus what we see with our local listed assets? Well, in fact, Google, we were just chatting about that before we came on air. And if you look at our market, the All Share Index, I mean, it's terribly concentrated into the market cap, at least, into a, a few stocks. So if you take the, the, the top three stocks, they, they account for about the third of the total market capitalization. Mm -hmm. So you're concentrating your risk by going in, into that, in, into the, the All Share Index. And so I think the, the answer really is to start uh, expanding your horizons a bit, looking offshore, looking for better returns uh, in, in areas that you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also a tricky one because we obviously need to take into consideration what exchange controls, but I'm assuming for the average retail investor, are there easy ways of maneuvering around this? Uh, but are there still some significant considerations to bear in mind? You know, it's become so easy to invest offshore. There are so many options available, uh, apart from the traditional routes, which would be asset swap. So you appoint an investment manager like ourselves, and we have asset swap capacity that we can extend to individual investors and take the money offshore. Of course, when they redeem the investments, we have to pay it locally. Um, and then the currency, the, the rules for taking hard currency offshore are, are still quite relaxed. You can take 1 million discretionary per annum. You can take 10 million per person between husband and wife, 20 million per annum. As long as you have, you know, a clear SARS record, that is easy to achieve. And we've taken actually much bigger amounts offshore. Mm. Apart from those opportunities, there are also a lot of inward listed opportunities. You know, the likes of uh, core shares locally has been quite active recently in terms of bringing some international investments on an inward listed basis. So actually the options are there already and they're easy to implement. I like that you bring up the core shares element because then it takes us back to the argument mm. of active versus mm. passive, which we've previously discussed mm. on the show. Mm. But I guess both uh, uh, strategies actually work when it comes mm. to uh, e effective diversification across portfolios. Is this a strategy that you've seen uh, a lot more clients being more inclined to, Chris? Look, I think you've got to see active and passive as being complementary. You know, one doesn't dominate over the other. Mm. So if you, if you go into, into active, um, the argument has been for many, many years that... Uh, one portfolio manager is not consistently going to, to outperform the market in whatever jurisdiction they, they happen to be. Uh, whereas ETFs for passive, 
tends to, to, to outperform o over a longer period of time. However, the reverse isn't true. If, you, if you're in a market that's going sideways to down, by definition, passive is going to go down with it. Mm -hmm. And the clever uh, passive, uh, uh, sorry, the clever active uh, portfolio manager will be able, by using skill, to be able to try and, um, and, and outperform the market on the way down. Mm -hmm. So as I say, they, they should be seen in a, com in a complementary fashion, and you, so you've got to balance them out. Makes a lot more sense. Google, there's also a risk, because if you blindly f go into these trackers, um, you could uh, blindly be taking additional, co we've just spoke about concentration of risk. A tracker by itself is not a solution to concentration of risk. So for example, if you were blindly buying the all share index tracker, you would get significant concentration of risk in Asperger mm -hmm. or in those top three shares. If you were blindly buying the S&P 500 or an Asterix tracker, you're going to get 20 to 30 percent tech sector exposure. Yeah. So it's not, it's an easy way to invest, but it's not a lazy way to invest. You, you, you know, we as professional portfolio managers often use it to supplement uh, our own stock picking because there may be sectors or geographies where simply we don't have the expertise or simply we don't have the appetite to take single stock risk and we want sector exposure, then we utilize it. So I don't think, uh, you know, the trackers or ETFs is a, is a, is a quick way out of those kind of risks that were highlighted earlier. So again, a considered decision, one that yeah. needs to be applied mm. to the investment strategy yeah. of the client that you're addressing. We've mm. spoken at length about uh, equities, no doubt, and of course, understanding the dynamics regarding mm. active and passive mm. and mm. both mm. being complementary. But what about geographic exposure? And mm. I say this because it is the 10th year anniversary mm. of the global financial crisis. And over the last few years, we've seen some interesting trends mm. uh, developed, mm. whether it's an mm. uptick in Chinese markets. We know that the Nikkei hasn't done anything in decades. Mm. Uh, US equities on the other hand seeing a significant surge mm. but those geographical splits versus what we also see um, 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 regarding the macroeconomic mm. trends do they often mm. go hand in hand sometimes mm. yes they do and in fact <coughs> right now we are seeing the US doing very well on the back of uh, a strong dollar a strong US economy um, liquidity being withdrawn from the global uh, system in yeah. terms of uh, the sort of draw of Did that do much for easing. the bond market space, though, um, uh, for a brief period? Uh, for a brief period, yeah. And uh, we're seeing emerging markets being so sold down. So m emerging markets almost as a group, and this is the geography, you know, plays into that, is will present to us. But it's not the right entry point just yet because we've got some concerns still regarding the impact of trade wars and the impact of some of these countries with big deficits mm. in, you know, against the headwind of a strong dollar and of rising interest rates. But at some point, it is going to become the asset class of choice, certainly for an active manager, given where valuations are being driven to right now and the negative sentiment for it. So, yes, I think geographic, uh, look, you also can get uh, emerging market exposure through developed market equities, but I don't think you're going to get the kind of pickup that you will get, you know, if the sentiment currently turns around compared to, for example, direct exposure into an emerging market. Mm -hmm. mm. Chris G, your thoughts on this one? No, absolutely. And, and, and in terms of just a holistic approach to the whole subject, um, you have to be diversified across very various geographic jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. and, and it's tricky now. I mean, I can't remember a time when, uh, in, in the past 30 years at least, when uh, it was so difficult to actually work out which is going to be, um, well, which, which areas are going to be the winners and which areas are going to be the losers. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as Chris says, you know, uh, the, the US appears to be in the ascendancy. Uh, EMs, emerging markets, not looking nearly so good. But that can change very, very rapidly, you know. Um, especially when you have such a volatile uh, president in, in, in charge in the US. So I think a lot of the dynamics uh, are very different from, from what we've seen in the past, which makes the whole process that much more difficult. And you've really got to be uh, on, on top of your game. Mm -hmm. I would like to add to that. I, <coughs> I think in the sh depending on your time horizon, it can be an impossibly difficult task. Mm -hmm. But if you have a longer term time horizon, I don't think the task is actually that difficult. If we look at emerging markets as a group, uh, w the world has grown at roughly 3%. Where's that growth come from? Not from developed markets. Developed markets as a group has grown uh, no more than 3% over the last 10 years. You can take any economy. 
whereas developing markets yeah. have all grown north of 3% over the last 10 years. And that's only the start of it. You know, take China as an example. You're now only seeing the economy shifting from infrastructure-led and export-led to consumer-led. And that consumption dividend is still playing through. So our view would be actually for the longer term, the answer is pretty clear. You've got to be in emerging markets. They're doing the heavy lifting mm -hmm. for the world's growth uh, into the future. But in the short term, uh, it's a bit of a mugs game. And the safest place to be actually is the US. And that can make it very uncomfortable, right? Because mm -hmm. for us as investors, we come to you seeking some advice and we actually want this perfect answer and perfect split. 30% mm -hmm. in US equities, 25 in uh, Asia, <coughs> so much in bonds and mm -hmm. cash and the likes. But is there a, a perfect recipe, especially for someone invested for the long term, five mm -hmm. to 10 years plus? Mm -hmm. I would just say one thing. I, 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 there isn't an answer. I would say there's an answer to saying, if you want growth, you need to uh, be invested in growth assets, ideally with the assistance of a professional, to make these dynamic allocations. And we're not, we're not talking about churning a portfolio every year. We're mm. talking about just making those adjustments, you know, uh, span your sails to where the wind's blowing, you know, over time. But the biggest problem we currently see with South African investors is that they are confusing the income requirements, short-term income requirements, with you know, their growth imperative. Mm. So actually having enough assets to keep your income safe and secure and have your growth assets, I wouldn't want to call it a separate bucket, but you have to classify them differently and look at them with a different lens, a longer term perspective. Mm -hmm. Something which you where you can tolerate the volatility, you're not going to look at these values on a monthly basis, even a quarterly basis, you will allow the process to play out over time. But you can only do that if you have adequately provided for liquidity over the next, uh, you know, um, and I would say it's a, a good period is actually two to three years. The JSE over the last three years Oof. has not delivered anything more than a cash return. Mm. So if you were not considering your income requirements when you invested, uh, you know, this would have been a, a massive disappointment and you could be um, drawing from... Uh, growth assets for the purpose of income, but that's because there was an inappropriate allocation to start off with. Yeah. Mm. So critical themes for us mm. certainly to consider, and of course for us as yeah. investors not to be swayed by many of the short-term headwinds, whether it's Trump's tweets or the macroeconomic dynamics, or even some interference that we see playing out in some emerging market states. Well, stay with us, because in just a moment we'll be exploring some of these stocks and ETFs for you to consider when it comes to enhancing your diversified portfolio. We'll be back with more right after this. Welcome back to Portfolio Watch, where we're taking a look at the number one rule of investing, diversification, diversification, diversification. To tell us more about some of the stocks we can explore to uh, enhance our portfolio performance, I'm joined in studio by Chris Potriter, who is the CEO of Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and another Chris, Gilmore this time, Independent Investment Analyst. Gentlemen, we clearly painted a very interesting synopsis about understanding diversification mm -hmm. in investment portfolios, and to touch on some stocks that actually provide that, Aspen is one of those, um, uh, Chris, that you like. Just looking at some of the recent reports they've come out with, share price took a significant knock, mm -hmm. earnings also under pressure, letting go of some of their key assets, and there's some anxiety uh, about some of the exposure that they have. So Aspen is one I would like to discuss. It's not one I would like to buy. Ah, <laughs> makes sense. There's a difference. So I think Aspen is a, is a good example of what we discussed, what Chris uh, mentioned earlier, of limited choice in the in the SA market. So you've got Aspen, that's basically our, your largest pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's available uh, to invest in on the JSE. You know, you've got Adcock, but uh, much smaller, much more limited, and there are a few other, other smaller cap uh, uh, companies. Um, but the tale of Aspen is the tale, unfortunately, of many South African companies of starting with a solid concept and then uh, overreaching uh, in terms of international expansion and diversification. So four Even though years it was in the right space as emerging markets, it though, was the right guess. space. You know, the acquisition of the baby milk formula business in China, the, the story for, uh, you know, milk formulas for infants is, is still strong. Uh, 
but effectively per Aspen's owner recognition, uh, management now needs to focus on the pharmaceutical business because they did further acquisitions after that acquisition and these new acquisitions done in 2017 have stretched the balance sheet in terms of debt and clearly they are facing significant competitive pressures and some other pressures which we aren't aware of in terms of managing these businesses. So there's a prime example of a company where if South Africans invested in this company because it was the only viable option on the JSE to give one uh, exposure to what is a good theme globally, and that is a, a, you know, an aging population in the developed world, even in the developing world is a need for medicine, and you want pharmaceutical exposure in your portfolio. But um, yeah, it just shows you what the risks are associated yeah. with the SA market. A lot of challenges are certainly seen mm. in that particular space. Mm. Let's move to another sector, this time in the financial services industry. And APSA is also one of those that mm. features on the list uh, this evening. Are we buying it? Do we like the Africanicity story here? Not necessarily the Africanicity. They made that name up. Um, <laughs> that, that's much longer term. Uh, but I think it will be positive in the much longer term. Yeah. I'm thinking locally. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of similarity between now and 1990. The euphoria that we saw at the beginning of the year has largely evaporated. I think it will come back, and I think SA Inc. stocks will come back into favour. Uh, we might not come out of recession quickly, we probably won't, but we will eventually come out of recession, mm -hmm. and these stocks that are sitting on single-digit PEs and high dividend yields, like mm -hmm. ABSA, uh, I think once they've had um, uh, a further degree, let, let, let me put this diplomatically, a further degree of uh, streamlining, then I think uh, they will be superbly placed to, uh, to, pa to participate in the growth that we will see in this economy in the next few years. Yeah. So taking on the short-term headwinds, to buying into the investment opportunity, especially given the low prices, and of course uh, not really reflecting many of the issues that we see in the macroeconomic challenges, right? Uh, exactly. Perfect. Mm. Another one that I'd like us to also focus on, which so often we think about from a South African perspective, but we forget that the operations mm. down under are also experiencing some challenges, is Woolies. Also in the retail space, mm. has managed to be a strong uh, representative mm. of mm. what we see regarding consumer trends in South Africa. And I recall, what, two, three years ago, this was one of the strong favorites in the retail sector. Still the case? Chris yeah. G? Chris yeah. P? Uh, <coughs> I think Woolworths, um, it's again an example of a South African company that is potentially overreached. You mm -hmm. remember a couple before Willys, it was Pick and Pay, it did the same thing in, yes. in Australia, and there's many such examples. Um, even Discovery paid the price in the US early on. Um, <coughs> David Jones is one problem, and they are turning it around, so it's, it's perhaps not the albatross around their neck that many say it is. I think they've got a challenge locally. They may have taken their eye off the ball mm -hmm. in terms not of their food business, but in terms of the apparel and, and um, uh, uh, you know, home goods uh, business. Mm -hmm. That business has, has really dragged down. The margins have compressed. The top line, um, you know, is, is, uh, is, uh, is declining as well. And it's, uh, it was a major contributor to Woolworths uh, total profitability four years ago. It's declined substantially. And now the risk actually is that Woolworths is so dependent on the food business and maintaining market share in that premium segment. Mm. And of course, what we're seeing is uh, checkers trading up. Yep. Uh, there's some independence, you know, fruit and veg city and the like also uh, trading into that market. So it's going to be really tough for Woolies in, in this environment. Uh, you know, they need to uh, you know, make sure that they can maintain their market share and their margins, profitability in the food business especially, whilst also fixing the apparel and, and home goods business. So we've given that one the benefit of the doubt for now, but it's a company we will be watching like a hawk. Even though we're in a technical recession currently, and of course uh, we know that consumers mm. like to spend, but yeah. that's come under pressure. Mm. Are mm. you still worried about this maybe being used as a proxy for the South African economy specifically, Chris? Yeah, as, as Chris says, look, this is predominantly a food company. The food yeah. company has, has gone incredibly well. Uh, but just to dimension this, I mean, if you go and buy a packet of Chuckles from, uh, from Woolies, a year ago you could get two packets of Chuckles for a, a Woolies share price. Today you can only get one. The thing's half. Um, and, you know, David Jones, department stores, it's a kind of outmoded concept. And I think Ian Moore has been banging this a bit too hard, coupled with the fact that interest rates are going to start rising in Australia fairly, fairly rapidly. Mm. When that happens, I think the Australian consumer is going to be under added pressure. So you put it all together, great company, from a consumer's perspective, I love it to pieces. And I think, I think they will stand the pressure from checkers and the like because they're in a, a very, very unique space.
but I think it's, it's going to be problematic for them in this kind of economy. Once the economy turns, no, like we're with ABSA, I think they'll do exceptionally well. Sure. I like that comparison regarding the chocolates though, right? Mm. Short-term mm. uh, pleasure now with the chuckles <laughs> or uh, withstand the long-term <laughs> pressures by buying one woolly mm. share. I also want us to take a look at another company based in the US, I understand, uh, Chris, mm. Aramark. Mm. Tell us and introduce us to this particular stock for those of us who aren't familiar with it. It's a bit like Bidcorp. It's a, a facilities company. So, you know, they're into um, doing restaurants, they're supplying restaurants. They, actually, they supply prisons with uniforms, funnily enough. That's, there's one of the big differences from, from the Bidcorp uh, okay. model. Um, in, in the past, they've supplied the Olympic Games when they've been held in the States and, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so th they're a very well-organized company. They've been listed, I think, now about four times. They've been taken out on various occasions, mo most recently at a private equity company. So they're shedding their, keep their cheap and nasty uh, private equity image, and they're getting more into a, um, uh, a proper listed company type of uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So I went to see them last year in, in Philadelphia, and uh, I tell you, this is, this is a great company. It's, it's, it's a very basic, solid company. It's not, it's not a fang type company. Uh, and I think it, it will do well as the US economy uh, gathers more pace. Mm -hmm. From a valuation point of view and share price perspective, mm -hmm. performance-wise? Share price, like this time last year, was $28. Today, it's $42. Sure. It's not expensive. I've forgotten the PE, but it's, 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 it's not huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some long-term growth, and again, mm -hmm. uh, so. reflecting uh, the dynamics mm -hmm. of the US economy. We've really focused on quite a few stocks that do provide that exposure, the pros and the cons. But mm -hmm. what about some of the trackers that we've also been able to identify? And I understand there's an iShares NASDAQ Biotechnology ETF. That sounds a bit scary for some of us, right? Because you think technology, you think about the trends, and of course mm. that there's all this rage around mm. many of mm. these themes right mm. now. But mm. potential future growth industry here, Chris. Yeah, so Google, I think that couples to the Aspen story in the sense that because you've got limit opportunity locally, you know, I mean, we shouldn't remain blind to the opportunities that actually exist internationally. So that tracker, for example, is, uh, you know, offered by iShares, which is a division of BlackRock. We use it extensively in our portfolios, the products of that company to give particular sector exposure. Uh, biotech will scare you, specifically if you take single company risk. I think that is what uh, you know, we're saying is it's not necessary. It's unnecessary to take single company risk when you actually have such a strong long-term theme for the sector. You're going to get a good return out of the sector. So invest in the you know, uh, exchange traded fund that gives you exposure to that sector and biotech in particular to us is one of those sectors. The other one which uh, uh, um, we didn't mention but that we've taken exposure through in a similar way is the semiconductor sector. So you can go and bet on a video as an example, you know, make money or lose money, whatever, but it's not necessary. The sector itself has got so many tailwinds behind it. Take the exposure to the sector through a sensible uh, exchange traded fund as part of your overall portfolio allocation. Yeah. Makes sense, especially for those who might be very uh, risk averse towards yes. many of these sectors. We did touch on the emerging market story just a moment ago and how from an equities mm -hmm. point of view, that's where a lot of the growth is expected yes. to come from, from uh, macroeconomic mm -hmm. fundamentals. But a China ETF that provides some exposure there, that's through the MSCI, mm -hmm. I understand, mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. providing some growth? Yeah, so that particular, there's a couple of uh, ETFs. One has got to be very careful sure. again. Do your homework. You can't be lazy when you select an ETF. It's a bit like selecting a stock. They uh, do mirror very different things in the markets. Uh, there's a particular uh, ETF which, which tracks uh, effectively mainland China uh, A shares. So those were the shares that previously weren't investable because they were on mainland China. Uh, now the MSCI is starting to include a lot of them in their uh, emerging markets uh, index and in, in the main the index in fact. Um, and, and, and this uh, ETF is going to give you good diversification as well, away from the big construction and financial services companies in China, where we think a lot of risks sit, and it's going to give you broad diversification to the Chinese consumer and to technology as well, which we know, of course, through the stories of Tencent and Alibaba has been doing well. Why this ETF is so uh, attractive to us at the moment is from a valuation perspective. China has sold off probably 20% from its eyes at the beginning of the year. Sure. And it will turn because, again, you've got so many tailwinds, you've got demographics working for it, it will turn. And I can't time the bottom, but I will tell you we're watching carefully for a good entry point.
Well, they always say what? It's not timing the market, or it's time in, in the, the market. market. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and joining us this evening. A big thank you to both Chris Potgieter, CEO of Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Chris Gilmore, independent investment analyst, for joining us this evening. Well, you as well, as well can continue giving us your feedback and sending your questions by tweeting at CNBC Africa and use the hashtag Portfolio Watch or email them to portfoliowatch at abn360.com. We'll see you again next week at the same time.